According to the Pearson Institute International Economics, globalization is the word used to describe the growing interdependence of the world's economies, cultures, and populations brought about by cross-border trade in goods and services technology and flows of investment, people, and information. The wide-ranging effects of globalization are complex and politically charged. As with the major technological advances, globalization benefits society as a whole while harming certain groups. Merriam-Webster defines it as the act or process of globalizing the state of being globalized, especially the development of an increasingly integrated global economy marked especially by free trade, free flow of capital, and the tapping of cheaper foreign labor markets. Who or what is pushing for globalization? How is globalization possibly a good thing? How is it possibly bad? What are the main concerns many people have about it? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. The German-born American economist Theodore Levitt is credited with creating and coining the term globalization in a 1983 article titled The Globalization of Markets. To many people, globalization is the uniformity of nations into a single entity, a mutually agreed upon arrangement connecting trade, currencies, immigration, even politics. To others, globalization is a clarion call to a socialist superstate where independent nations would lose their autonomy, their populations would lose their individual rights and laws, identities and cultures, and become absorbed into a one world movement for better or worse. Examples of globalization include intergovernmental organizations, Globalization has made it possible for the international organizations to be created through treaties between many different countries. Examples include the European Union, the United Nations, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and the International Monetary Fund. Two, intergovernmental treaties. Many governments across the world have engaged in treaties or trade policies that make it easier for international investment and trade these treaties, called free trade agreements, including the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA, are examples. Three, multinational corporations do business in many different countries. Globalization is the reason that multinational businesses exist. For example, Globalization allows major U.S. corporations to sell their products to Mexico, Europe, Africa, South America, Australia, and China. Some would argue that we are already globalized with regard to our economies and exchange of currencies, and that may be very true. Yet this is not a new or unique condition. For over 3,000 years, as the barter system began to fade, even ancient cultures and societies were trading on an international scale and they used the same basic currencies of precious metals as their economic base. Middle Eastern kingdoms traded with Europeans for metals such as gold, silver, iron ore, and copper. Chinese silk was sold to the Greek and Roman empires, and spices and precious stones from India have been found in ancient burial sites in Northern Europe. Ivory from India and Africa was traded all over the known world, as was olive oil from the Mediterranean regions. Wool and wine from Western Europe found its way to Asia, with much of its international traffic being on the famous Silk Road, as well as the growing fleets of merchant ships reaching ports on three continents. These were in fact dynamic international transactions and trade flourished, but was this true globalization? Some would argue yes, and it was only expanded by the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. More people, more wealth, and a greater variety of commodities could be shipped further and faster and in greater quantities than ever before. As industry, science, and technology grew, the world grew smaller. 
Some would also argue that the North American Free Trade Agreement, as well as the World Trade Organization, are examples of globalization, but that only affects trade, not governments and their societies. Under these plans, nations are still independent and their people have the rights to choose their own paths. Still, can this be considered globalization? I say no, not in the strictest sense. True globalization would mean creating a hegemony of all nations, all cultures, into a coalition of the willing to abide by being governed by a single approved state entity. True, unbridled globalization would mean following the example of the European Union, which, while a minor example, has some correlation. The individual nations of Europe who joined the Union still maintained their own national elections, but their mandates came from Brussels, Belgium. Globalists oppose capitalism or free trade across borders and consider it as protectionism, an economic policy that attempts to protect domestic businesses from foreign competition and labor markets. But true globalists want far more than that. The EU nations also had very little say in their own national immigration policies. Their unified currency was considered a successful economic move, but their open borders between nations has not been what I would call the smart move. Perhaps the smartest nation in Europe to join the EU was Great Britain, who kept their own currency, the British pound, and did not adopt the euro. And this made them a powerful factor with regard to international trade and economic power. Recently, Following the Brexit, when Great Britain voted to leave the EU, mainly due to the open borders policies enforced upon them and the inability to enforce their own immigration laws, Poland, Austria, and Hungary, as prime examples, have tightened their own border security to protect their populations from unfettered and uncontrolled immigration. Other EU nations, such as Belgium, France, Sweden, Norway, Ireland, and Germany, paid the price for their being naive and altruistic with regard to their extreme liberal applications of illogic. Many of these cultures, especially some Muslims, fail to assimilate into their adoptive cultures. They often refuse to even follow the local laws, and in some cities, they have established their own private micro-communities separate from the mainstream population. These are sometimes very dangerous areas for non-Muslims to enter, and even many police departments will not enter these areas, where the locals there often practice Sharia law. For example, one BBC report quoted a London Metropolitan Police officer named Rob. He stated, Regarding no-go areas in London, with gang crime in London, there are areas which you wouldn't go into as a pair of cops in a car, because of the fear of having things thrown at you when you're driving through certain estates, bottles, etc. Bosses had told officers to avoid wearing uniforms in certain places in the capital. Also, Swedish police have named dozens of vulnerable areas marred by criminality. The study, an update on the previous report from 2015, names 61 places with low socioeconomic status where criminality has a significant effect on the community. The local reported that those living in these places are often also vulnerable to religious radicalization. Of the areas, 23 are considered especially vulnerable where there is a widespread disinclination to participate in the judicial process and the situation is considered acute. Some of these immigrants who enter Western countries are so radicalized that they even conduct honor killings, such as the case of Nora Fela Al-Maleki, who is an Iraqi-American woman living in Arizona, killed by her father for becoming too Western by running her over with a car and an honor killing. He then fled to Egypt to avoid prosecution. Globalization also fails to take into account the radical thought processes and sense of entitlement brought by certain groups into their adoptive nations. Therefore, having a single government entity to enforce universal laws and alter cultural thought processes seems quite unlikely, and many nations and societies would not want to change their ways. Citing the report from the European Parliament, Europe is currently being overwhelmed by a wave of rape committed by Muslim migrants. Particularly in Scandinavian countries, the number of rapes of white women and girls is rising. 
These women are considered by Muslim migrants as third-class citizens. In the English town of Rotherham alone, 1,400 white girls were abused, raped, and murdered by Muslim gangs over a period of years. Many of these incidents are gang rapes. Many local city councils in England, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark know very well how things stand, but conceal the real situation for fear of being accused of racism. Which is ridiculous since Islam is a religion and not a race. If, despite all this, rape charges are still brought, it is usually the perpetrators and not the victims who are treated leniently because the perpetrators claim that the women had consented to sexual intercourse. If these abuses are raised by local politicians, they are sometimes convicted of slandering ethnic groups. These nations have been rocked by internal violence, terrorist attacks, high crime rates, heavy pressure on their social services, stiff competition for their own domestic workers competing for work in the labor markets with immigrants, and cultural difficulties due to the lack of assimilation, especially for many African and Middle Eastern immigrants. Globalization doesn't result in an increased number of jobs or make workers' lives better. Instead, it redistributes jobs by moving production from high-cost countries to lower-cost ones. This means that high-cost countries often lose jobs due to globalization as production goes overseas, as seen with U.S. companies going overseas when taxes and operating costs are too high. Globalists like the enemy of freedom, George Soros, would have us surrender our individual national currencies and move to a universally approved and easily controlled if not manipulated currency. Of course, he and his ruling class would manage the finances. They would eliminate national banks and independent financial institutions and control the world currency from a single monolithic financial center. This organization would be managed by what George Orwell called those who are equal above others. Modern globalization would also mean an end to individual national politics if people like the socialist Soros had their way. Understand that people who like this idea are the ones who want to be in command, not part of the collective masses who would have to follow the orders and abide by their rules. Those in leadership would never follow their own laws because globalization would make them the law and the masses would have no legal recourse. Another problem with globalization is determining who would control the education, what would that look like, and how would that affect thousands of different cultures. Then there is the concept of a globalized military, in essence a global armed forces answerable to a single authority, in essence a dictatorship. We already see how the United Nations has consistently failed at peacekeeping when throwing soldiers together from many nations. Also, countries like the U.S. pay the majority of the U.N. bills, while many other nations who contribute virtually nothing and have abysmal human rights records still sit on important councils and have voting rights. How would the globalists balance those books? Their problems with language barriers, religious and cultural differences, right down to dietary issues according to religion would have to be addressed. That same problem would exist in the global education system, mandated by a single authority. We saw how well that worked in National Socialist Germany and Communist nations where indoctrination was part of the educational process, much like what liberal Marxists are trying to do in the United States today, Australia, and in Europe. How would the dedicated globalists address those issues? Which political paradigm would they adopt? A representative republic? A democracy? A monarchy? A socialist state? Globalization in much smaller versions has been tried and failed, such as the Roman Empire. It was under one currency, one government, one military system, and one polytheistic religion until the 4th century. The Catholic Church tried it with the Holy Roman Empire, trying to reel in Europe's rulers under a single authority, the Emperor, who only answered to the Pope, and that did not work out too well. Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin tried it with communism, and that lasted 74 years. Again, the same program as the Romans minus religion. China is still communist since 1949, but it is straining to become capitalist economically while maintaining tyranny at home. The Japanese tried it in Asia as they extended their empire as well as Nazi Germany. Both nations tried to create a monolithic community under singular authority by use of military force and terror. 
The only answer that fits with their agenda is some form of socialism, perhaps not communism, as it still allows for private ownership of property and sometimes allows for religion. But it also allows for complete population control under draconian penalties required for noncompliance. It may be that program the globalists want to adopt as the elite live well, they still make money off the slave labor of others, steal intellectual property, and the government dictates every aspect of their lives, and there is little if any public outcry for fear of reprisals. We have already seen the discredited World Health Organization, the idiotic Centers for Disease Control in the United States, and the Biden administration's insane mandates on COVID-19 vaccines, boosters, masks, and lockdowns that harmed millions and killed possibly tens of thousands and cost even more millions of people their jobs and careers. People around the world, especially Americans who think for themselves, have rejected that idiocy in their majority, but that resistance would be impossible under a globalized government. That's why it would not work. You would first have to subdue a people, have them comply, before you can rule. They would also have to select socialism due to their desire to have collectivization of assets in all areas, and this has already begun in the areas of agriculture. Nations such as China and individuals such as Bill Gates have been buying American farmland. One of the more insane concepts is eliminating the meat industry in favor of meat grown in laboratories. The control of agriculture is to control a population, and it is also a national defense issue. Globalization eliminates the national concern in favor of the new and expanded centrally controlled matrix. Returning to the currency issues, the globalists want to have all currencies switch to a digital currency, eventually unified into a single global monetary system. This is a bad idea on many levels. Such a program would give the globalist government, or even an individual government, going on digital, the means to control what people spent money on, determine if they could in fact spend their own money on items they wished to have, and even restrict the amount of money they could spend entirely. Welcome to socialism. They could more easily monitor and track all of your transactions, and if the government decided that it did not want you to buy certain property, a certain automobile, or even firearms, they could close your account. Then the global government would have to contend with writing new laws for the collective. How would they be able to codify laws and maintain the United States Bill of Rights for those people or the laws of other nations? Would they allow the First and Second Amendments to become global? Definitely not, because totalitarian regimes do not want free speech, nor do they want an armed populace capable of stiff resistance. That is why the Europeans are at the mercy of their own governments and the EU right now. What makes the globalists think that India and China, the two largest national populations, would agree to be governed in such a way? What about the countries under Sharia law? Would the religious nuts in Iran agree? How about parliamentary monarchies and the laws their people live by? How would they enforce compliance? Would they demand that to be a part of a global environment a global government that Americans abandon their guns and internal combustion engines? Would they expect the Muslims to abandon their faith? Globalization in total, including financial, economic, military, judicial, societal, educational, cultural, national identity compliance, is problematic and unenforceable. In essence, the concept of total singular worldwide control in all areas is as insane as any concept can be. For example, of 335 million Americans, if only one quarter of that population resisted such a move, the government loses. But this is what the liberal socialists want, total control at every level to include rigging elections to try and achieve their objectives. This is why Biden opened the border. Even the Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, and Border Patrol acknowledge that at least 6 million, if not more than 8 million illegal immigrants have crossed into the U.S. with the Biden administration's blessing violating federal immigration law. Over 200 of these men captured were on the U.S. and international terrorist watch list. The only question is how many escaped detection, adding to the unverified total number. This unfettered mass migration is a part of globalism. 
These persons flood into American cities, draining resources and increasing crime rates and social tensions, and many of them are not assimilating. Just these facts alone illustrate that complete social, economic, and cultural globalization is a liberal Marxist fantasy. If globalization were simply restricted to business economics, more people may be on board with it. But the socialists are not accepting half measures. Soros, whose family benefited during the Holocaust in 1944 by turning in their fellow Jews and confiscating their wealth, is not about half measures. And people like him would never live under the same laws they would expect all of us to live by. Finally, the only way to resist this attempt at total control is to effectively resist by voting, building civilian coalitions of like-minded people and making sure that we have elected officials who share those concerns. But just remember that we are not the world. We are Americans with our history, unifying culture, currency, social mores and laws, and a deep-rooted sense of right and wrong. Other nations have their own histories, pride, and national identities. So let's keep it that way. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.